All right, everybody, this is the first topic that you learn content for. This is topic 1.1, and we're going to be contextualizing the first time period that we're going to study, which is 1491 to, the, to 1607. So here we go. So what are you going to learn in this lecture? So the first thing you're going to learn is how Native American societies adapted to their environment and transformed their environment through innovations in agriculture, resource use, and social structure. Okay. So that's the stuff we're going to learn in this lecture. So specifically, the time that we're going to talk about is the time between about 4000 BC, where recorded history begins, and then 1607, which is the settling of the first British uh, city settlement in North America. Okay? So if we go a little bit more into context here, uh, this time period is the time period when natives crossed the Bering Sea, the Bering Strait, which I'm going to show you in a map, and they arrived in what is now today the United States. And so it's kind of this time period here, these roughly four, uh, I'm sorry, 3,000 years between these two dates. Now, if you kind of think about it a little more expanded, between the year that Columbus arrived and 1607, it's about 115 years. And then from 1607 to 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was signed, it's another 170 years. And then from there to today, it's combined about roughly 200, 215 years, right? So we have a lot of time between these uh, uh, periods, but it seems like a lot because of human time scales, right? But in the in the span of time that that people have been on Earth and that the Earth has been around, it's a very, very small scale, right? So anyway, natives arrived into what is now North America through migration, and so over time, they developed distinct and increasingly complex societies by adapting to their environment and by transforming their environment. And each one of these civilizations had a diverse set of, of environmental and geographical characteristics that they had to deal with. So, for example, as these people are crossing into what is now North America over 25,000 years, uh, these people are encountering different climates. They're encountering different landscapes. They're even encountering different kinds of uh, animals and plants. And so because of all those conditions, a lot of them decided to adapt differently to where they lived. Uh, the ones that lived in Mexico and South America, for example, uh, decided that they were going to go grow corn and, and mice, as we call it, maize in Spanish. And because they were successful in growing it, they were able to adapt to the environment that they lived in. And a lot of them grew really sophisticated uh, large civilizations because they were able to sustain them because they had enough food. So for example in Peru where we found this little statue uh, people grew corn and they grew it on mountainsides on terraces that kind of stretched out throughout the Andes Mountains. Now in what is now um, southern New Mexico, what is the southwest of the United States, corn planting uh, arrived there as early as 2000 before the Common Era. So 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. The Pueblo people that lived there used irrigation systems to grow their corn. So this is a Pueblo settlement there in what is now Taos, New Mexico. And a lot of these people established their homes in the desert uh, using mud and, and wood and any little material they could find naturally. Right. So a lot of these complex cities like, like the one you see here uh, were established in that way. Now, agriculture was able to sustain large populations in the United States as well, in what is now the United States. So Cahokia, which is in present-day Missouri and Illinois, was among the largest permanent settlements in North America. And this one was established during the first millennium after Christ, or uh, during the Common Era. And Cahokia was home to about 25,000 people at the height of its civilization. And so Cahokia was settled there uh, in between the intersection of a few rivers, and the reason that it looks flat like this is that this is a flat land near the Great Lakes. And so you have to think about, geographically speaking, how these people adapted. Uh, they, they decided to establish their home there because it was at the, at the center of these sources of fresh water. And then aside from that, to have these kind of flat plains where they could grow food and where they could have their ceremonial, uh, ceremonial buildings, they decided to burn down some forest. So a lot of these woodlands were cleared by the people of Cahokia. And then they grew corn 
But aside from growing corn, they were able to grow beans and squash, which grown together yielded a lot more food that uh, would sustain higher population densities. So their cities grew more and more dense. Uh, this system is called three sister farming. And it was a method that reached this south southeastern region of North America around a thousand years after the common era. So this is what it looks like. You've got your corn stalk here and then the beans and squash grow around it. And the nutrients from one plant feed the, the, the plant of, of another uh, category. So like the squash or the bean. And this is how it looks in, in a photograph in real life. So because of that agriculture, more and more societies were able to grow more and more complex. And so one of them was in the northeastern woodlands of North America, and they're called the Iroquois. And the Iroquois had an empire that was pretty sizable by uh, 1500. And so by the time that Europeans arrived in what is now North America, they had a confederacy. A confederacy is like a loose union of states. And they had complex military and political alliances that lasted over a hundred years. So they were a pretty complex society. And as you can tell here in this diagram, uh, they had several nations kind of loosely tied together through trade and through protection, through alliances. Some of them uh, fought militarily against others. Some of them protected others. So that's how they were able to maintain. And they also traded. They traded all the way from here, from the St. Lawrence River region in what is now the Great Lakes area in modern day US and Canada, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, where the Mississippi River starts. So in these societies, gender roles were a little different than what we had in European societies. In native societies, for example, women tended to generally tend the crops. That means that they were the farmers. And men hunted and gathered for the most part. Not every society was the same, but in general, this was the rule. So this way of life granted a lot more authority to women, and these women were able to kind of use that authority to control certain decisions in the family and in the community. So a lot of these families were matrilineal. The husband would marry the wife, and, and he would go live with the wife uh, and her family. And so mothers and grandmothers had like a really big uh, piece in this, in this piece of authority. So this is a map that shows you the extent of all the peoples that lived here in North America before the Europeans came. And so as you can see, when we zoom into the United States, for example, there's a lot of these people living around a lot of these areas in the country. Now, they're mostly settled in sparse, uh, not very concentrated areas. Uh, but you do have some places where there are a lot more people than others. Like the United States is a lot more uh, densely populated at the time than Canada, for example. But you have, also have to look at the environment in Canada. It's very cold. You've got your subarctic and arctic climate, and that does not allow for a lot of people. Okay? And then when you go down to Mexico, to the southern part of North America, you see that the biggest empire here was the Aztecs. The Apache and Comanche all already had a lot of uh, settlements here in the northern part of Mexico in the desert. But for the most part, they were kind of divided by these mountain ranges in Mexico and by the desert in Mexico. The Aztecs were able to survive a lot because in this part of Mexico, there were a lot of rivers, there were a lot of lakes. And so that's fertile soil for growing corn. Okay. So finally, native societies generally revered the environment. So they, they kind of respected the physical world because they believed that it had spiritual um, qualities. And these spiritual qualities helped the people survive. So for example, when the god of rain was pleased, then they would get rain. When the, when the sun god was pleased, they would get nice sunny days, right? But sometimes they decided that they had to kind of take things into their own hands. And for one, some groups decided that they needed to clear areas of the forest. And so some of them would lar uh, ignite large forest fires because they would use them to create these open fields where they could go hunting. And so you can imagine uh, some game like deer going into this flat area and kind of sticking out and it would be much easier to hunt it versus out in the woodlands. Okay. Now native societies before European contact were largely separated and sparse like I told you earlier across the continent. But by 1492, we estimate, we historians and scientists, we estimate that there was about 4 million Native Americans on the continent, especially in this area north of Mexico. So by the time that British, Spanish, and French settlers came to North America, there was a lot of people living here already. 
And as you've been told before, maybe in your world history class, maybe in, in another place where you've learned this, a lot of these settlers came to North America by accident. Okay? And when they finally decided to establish kingdoms here and, and establish places where they would settle, a lot of these natives would kind of confront these people that came from Europe. And that's what we're going to learn about next time.